Editas Medicine is translating the promise of CRISPR technology with the goal of developing new novel and innovative products. And we are not, we're exploiting this technology, optimizing the technology all in the context or the majority of the work that's going on in the company is done in concert in combination with ad advancing novel therapies. So we're not uh, developing technology independent, we're doing everything together. Some of the questions or issues that we've grappled or discussed since before we launched the company over two years ago is which are the, the diseases that we can tackle today based on the state of the art of the technology and which are the disease indications that are springboard for expanding within based on the learnings based on additional indications within those therapeutic areas and which, in the context of technology, which technology improvements will have the broadest impact and will allow us to address a, a, a broad set of diseases. Uh, I'm gonna introduce CRISPR for people that are not familiar. CRISPR relies on a very simple and elegant system. It's an endonuclease derived from bacteria, a protein, an enzyme that can make, that makes uh, its wild type form a double-stranded break in the DNA. And the way that it gets to its target site, it's guided by 100 nucleotides RNA called the guide RNA. And the simplicity of the system relies on those 20 or so nucleotides in the five prime end, they're highlighted in blue here, that are homologous to the target site. So all you have to do in order to target different sites in the genome is really modify those blue nucleotides right there. So you can test in parallel multiple guides RNAs around a large region and, and choose the ones that are more effective. So the enzyme makes the cut um, based on the direction of the guide RNA, but the real ball game or the critical aspects of this technology is when the cell takes over and makes a repair. <coughs> And we exploit different repair mechanisms to, to make different corrections. There are two well-known, or there's many different repair mechanisms, but divided very broadly around non-homologous end joining, where you can make a cut and then revise the DNA, either by insertions or deletions based on one cut. Or you can also use NHEJ or non-homologous end joining, make two cuts, and delete something out, and I'll show you an example of that. Or you can make two cuts, or NICs, as I will show you also, and use homology-dependent repair um, to actually correct the mutation of interest. NAGJ is much more prevalent. HDR is less prevalent, and so the balance, what we're doing in the company, is also trying to um, manipulate the balance of those pathways to obtain the kind of repair that we need. We're using different delivery modalities at this point early on in the company. We're very agnostic to the delivery modalities and we're trying to map, map the available delivery modalities to the diseases of interest. And I'll show you during the presentation an example of using electroporation, the Maxite system, which you'll hear about, I think, tomorrow, and then an example of local delivery. I talked about the company developing a platform. The way that we think about the platform or we, you know, how do we organize our thinking is really around four interconnected components. The, the molecular machinery itself or the nuclease engineering, then the delivery modality, the control and specificity, how do we control, and then the, the, the editing mode. So in the nuclease or engineering of the molecular machinery, we're creating a toolbox of different kinds of Cas proteins that allow us to do different type of editing. Then we're also evaluating various delivery modalities in-house to provide efficient delivery of this molecular machinery to the target site. Then we're also very interested in controlling both the location and the amount of editing in a specific cell. 
This is not easy, but it's something that we want to, to do as we develop our products. And the most critical part is really what the cell does after the cut and how, as I mentioned before, we can manipulate those pathways in a safe fashion to obtain the amount of editing. So when we think about the technology groups, we've organized them around those four interconnected components. The rest of the slot, the rest of the presentation, I'll focus on showing you some tidbits of data um, based on our both technology development and advancing medicines. This is an example of characterizing a smaller Cas protein. The majority of the data presented, shown to date, and a lot of the papers are using uh, Streptococcus, Streptococcus pyogenes as a 4.7 kilobase um, enzyme doesn't fit into an AAV vector. Us and others then took Staph aureus um, uh, Cas protein. It's small and it allows us not only to fit this protein and all in one in an AAV vector, but also to address multiple different sites in the, lo in the, in the chromosomes, in the human chromosome, because it, the protein also itself has a slightly different recognition domain than the, um, the staph or uh, the um, streptococcus pyogenes. And here is a slide, just as a quick example of showing you that both of these proteins have similar activity there. They edit, we took overlapping regions where the, there's overlap where, where these enzymes recognize the sequence, and you can see that they, they have very similar activity. So this is an example of adding to the repertoire of tools um, to address various diseases. Now switching gear to delivery. Um, before we even did the Juno collaboration around engineer T cells, we started to try to edit primary T cells and HSCs. Tricky thing to do. These kinds of cells don't like to be manipulated. And here is the beginning of the technology development where through electroporation, we took messenger RNA coding for the protein along with the guide RNA electroporated into those cells and also tried a ribonucleotide complex where we took a purified protein, combined it with the guide RNA, so now the protein is activated, and through electroporation, we deliver them into jerkat cells, which are T-like cells, and here I'm using an example of PD-1. And as you can see, the RNP, or the ribonucleotide complex, is more efficient in, 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 in editing, and we maintain good viability. In this slide, we took those learnings or those improvements of modifying both the protein and the guide RNA in order to get efficient editing, and now we're able to modify primary T cells to over 80% with some targets. As you can see here, there's a target a guide RNA that behaves very well and another one that doesn't behave as well and then you go back to the drawing board and continue to improve it. Importantly, the cells are still alive. Early on we killed a lot of cells in order to get to this data. The same was true with HSCs and we just presented at ESGCT some data on editing um, hemoparietic stem cells. Now switching gear, and this is a complicated slide, but the message here that I want you to take home is that I told you the enzyme comes and makes a cut, and then we want to manipulate the pathways, the different repair pathways, to try to get the right of editing. One way to manipulate those pathways is by the type of cut that the enzyme makes. The wild-type protein makes a double-stranded blunt cut, and there are mutants that have one or two of their cutting domains mutated, and they can make NICs. And so if you bring two guide RNAs, you can generate a five prime overhang or a three prime overhang. And it, so you can see in here we're using the HBB locus as an example to edit in sort of an appropriate cell type. 
And you can see when you make a double-stranded cut, you have a lot of deletions, sort of the, there's chewing in, and very little insertions and very little gene conversion that involves HDR. But you can manipulate those pathways and have a different type of editing occur by either having a three prime end or a five prime end. So we're exploiting, exploiting this to do different type of editing and different cell types. Now I'll su switch gear to an in vivo program that we're working on. LCA10, liver congenital amaurosis, is a retinal degenerative disease that with, uh, involves loss of vision by the late teens, early 20s. It's a pretty fast progressing disease, so it allows you, for us, if it was too slow, then if you go in and edit, you can't see the advantages. So there's a lot of components of this disease that allows us to really advance the technology pretty quickly. So it's a combination of there's a medical need, but it also allows us to take the state of the art of the technology and move it into the clinic quickly. Why did we choose LCA10? Unmet medical need, the gene is too large for putting it into the traditional uh, delivery modalities of the eye. There's no gene therapy, th there's no therapy available. Importantly, when developing a new technology, you have to think about the biology, the regulatory path, and the clinical path. Here, we have visual acuity and other measurements or at clinical endpoints where we can measure to see the effect of our uh, new medicine. The eye is, we have two of them. We'll, we will be treating only one eye, so it's a perfect control. And the eye is thought to be semi-immune compromise, uh, privileged organ. Then around delivery, we're taking advantage of all the fantastic work that the gene augmentation world has done and use AAV to deliver subretinal um, to, to the eye. And we're working with experts. This is how we do a lot of our, our programs. We work with academics, with experts in the field that understand the disease and can help us bring this novel technology to the patients. And the most important part, and I'll show you um, in the next few slides, we can use the technology that exists today in order to address this disease. So the mutation of this disease is a mutation in an intron. And so the idea, and it creates, the mutation creates an alternative splice, and then you, you have a truncated protein because it generates a premature stop, uh, stop codon. So early on what we did is we tried to cut very close to where the mutation exists, where the arrow is, and we couldn't delete enough of, of, the, of the sequence to remove the alternative or the um, aberrant splicing. And so then we went in and we made two cuts. We optimized different guides RNAs, made two cuts, and now in the following slides I can show you that we get the right splicing and we get the right protein. Most importantly, we use Staph aureus, the protein that I told you about that is small enough that we can fit it into an AAV vector with two guide RNAs in the regulatory regions of interest. So this is some data just showing you that indeed when we bring two optimized guides, RNAs, we shift the balance between the wild type and the mutant transcript. And you can see by the orange that with the guide RNAs, you shift that balance between mutant and, and wild type. And we also shift the balance or we increase the amount of, of wild type protein. So where are we today? Um, we're uh, doing specificity studies with these guide RNAs. Um, we're doing functional assays using these ICUP models. These are um, iPS cells that get differentiated in photoreceptor cells. We're also planning to do editing in an explanted retinas. And we're going to confirm editing in non-human primates and also look at immunogenicity. And based on all this data, then we hope um, to start non-clinical development. So my last slide is just I've given you, hopefully you've gotten the take home message that we're advancing this technology to develop products. We've shown some effective um, editing in vitro. Um, we hope to have additional data in vivo. And we have multiple programs that are ongoing and we'll share those programs as they continue to advance. So thank you. <laughs>